All right, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Godwin, and I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange Program with the University of Florida. Thank you for joining us today. I'm excited about our presentations coming up from Dr. Rod Lynn, senior scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and Kevin Hires, wildland fire scientist at Tall Timbers Research Station. Together over the next hour, they will be talking about recent research to develop a new fire model to support the prescribed fire community. All right, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Rod Lynn is a senior scientist in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Division at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Rod has been performing research in the area of wildland fire modeling since 1995. For over two decades, he has served as principal investigator for a process-based coupled fire atmospheric model, FireTech. Rod leads Los Alamos efforts to use next generation process-based wildfire models for the study of fundamental wildfire behavior, evaluation of prescribed fire tactics, understanding influences of complex environmental conditions on fire behavior, risk assessment for critical facilities, and wildfires interaction with other landscape disturbances, such as insects or drought. Most recently, he has partnered with a group of researchers at Los Alamos U.S. Forest Service and Tall Timbers to apply what has been learned through physics-based wildfire modeling to, develop, to the development of a new type of fast-running simula simulation tool that can be applied to prescribed fire applications, which we'll be learning about today. Our next speaker, J. Kevin Hires, is a wildland fire scientist at Tall Timbers Research Station where he leads research projects in fire behavior, fire management, fuel moisture, and the fluid dynamics of fire effects. He has worked at the interface of science and management for 25 years to help enhance tools and techniques to safely ap apply prescribed fire for management objectives. He has served as a fire ecologist, a prescribed fire burn manager, and a fire management officer at Eglin Air Force Base, where there, they burned on average of 100,000 acres per year, quite the program. His research career began at the Joseph W. Jones Ecological Research Center in South Georgia, studying fire ecology and managed fire regimes. His research has focused on building large interdisciplinary research teams to connect combustion science to ecological effects and smoke management. He's co-authored more than 90 peer-reviewed publications. With that, Welcome, Rod. Welcome, Kevin. So glad to have you guys here with us today. We're looking forward to your presentations. And one moment, everyone, as we, as we trade out the slides. So I'm going to give the first half of this talk. And, um, and Kevin's going to follow up. But it's important to acknowledge that uh, there are a number of people, some of them listed on the slides, and others working behind the scenes that have contributed to the material in this in this talk. So it's certainly not just Kevin and I, and um, and it's important to acknowledge those folks. So uh, let's figure out for some reason my okay. Um, so I want to start by backing up and just talking about fire behavior and our approach to fire behavior over the last couple of decades, and that is to think of fire as a combination of a number of coupled processes, which are at a more, much more basic level. Fire behavior is, is, a, is a combination of the balances between those processes. And we're talking about things like various modes of heat transfer, uh, aerodynamic drag of the vegetation, rea chemical reactions, uh, the influence of the fire on the atmosphere around it, which changes the flow field and therefore changes the heat transfer mechanisms they, themselves, both heating and cooling. And so our, our approach has been to try to break fire behavior down into a series of building blocks that 
go together to create uh, what we call fire behavior. And so with that said, um, many of those building blocks are reasonably under, reasonably well understood from a from a very fundamental level. I mean, you've got convective heat transfer, you've got radiative heat transfer and conduction and and um, and and there are things like the combustion, which is nominally understood, but it's still very complex. However, when you start putting those building blocks together, the problem gets much more difficult. And there are still lots of challenges to predicting uh, their behavior when they're tied together. Some of these challenges include a really wide range of important link scales. So we've got everything from flame sheets, which are happening at submillimeter, to plume dynamics and atmospheric dynamics, which are happening at kilometer scales. And so all of those uh, factors are influencing the way a fire behaves. And unfortunately, that's still not tractable to represent them all with uh, with existing computing power. Not to mention, we oftentimes don't have the data to stipulate all of them precisely either. So uh, the next challenge is that all those different phenomena that I, and building block mechanisms that I spoke of on the previous slide, they're all coupled together in a very complex way. And so isolating any single portion or single mechanism is very challenging, especially in the field, especially if you're dealing with, astro, with natural vegetation. Uh, Folks like Mark Finney and the people at Missoula Fire Lab and other places have done a nice job of trying to isolate some of these effects with wind tunnels. Um, but the, the more you add on nature and its natural variability, the, the more complex this coupling becomes and the harder it is to understand what the influence of individual pieces are. Um, with that said, those heterogeneities in the fuels and in the wind fields and even the topography are really important parts of determining the way fire behaves. Oftentimes we want to think about a landscape looking at it from a very uh, a very high level as homogeneous. You know, we've got continuous forest for for many miles. But the truth is that the heterogeneity within that forest is in the gaps between the trees or the the presence of the gaps between the tree and the ground and the presence of shrubs those that heterogeneity matters and so we've got to figure out how to how to account for that and the the probably the the real crux here is that this is a very challenging environment to do detailed observations. But a lot of people like Marty Alexander, um, who have spent their lifetime doing really good observations, and they'll probably be the first to tell you that each fire is a little bit different and understanding and characterizing those fires is a really challenging thing. So it makes it even harder for us when we develop models to do validation because you have to measure the details of the fire environment in order to bound what your fire behavior is gonna look like. So these physics-based coupled fire atmosphere models, um, they're, they're typically, and there's, and there's a number of examples, uh, such as FireTech, which some of the results I'll sh show in just a minute are are from FireTech, but there's also WFES, and there's a couple of other models that are coming out of Europe right now. So um, the the general lay of those models is, is they use a uh, they use a discretization of the of a volume. So you see on the right, this is a, a rectangular discretization of 
a volume that includes some trees. And what that means is we break it up into cells and the trees exist in some cells and some cells are just spaces between trees and in other cells down to the surface, you have surface fuels. And in those cells, you explicitly resolve the average air movement within a cell and the exchange of air and the exchange of heat between the cells so you can capture the influences of topography and the influences of macro scale vegetation structure, the gaps between trees, for instance. You can, you can resolve the effects of buoyancy on the flow field. And so the hope is that, that you, the more things you can explicitly resolve, the better your simulation should be. Unfortunately, there's, if you want to do landscape scale simulations, there's a limit to how small those cells can be. And right now, if you want to do landscape scale simulations on maybe on, on the order of kilometers, then you, you, you can't go much below a meter. And so there's a lot of things in wildfire that depend on subgrid processes that are happening below a meter. So there's fine scale temperature distributions within a cell. The, the flame sheet is really hot, but it might be in training air that's, that's much cooler. So within smaller than a meter, you have a lot of temperature variations. The same with a lot of the mixing and chemistry and combustion processes. Most of those are happening at sub-meter scales. There's fine scale turbulence that's affecting everything. There's, there's the momentum or, or drag effects of the vegetation on the atmosphere that's happening at a very small scale, um, as well as the heat transfer mechanisms. And so that, those subgrid scale, those subgrid um, processes that are represented below the grid cell, there's still a lot of room for improvement on those. And there's, there's several, several research groups that are working on improving those process, the representations of those processes. And, um, and, and I don't want to make it sound like these models are done. I don't want to make it sound like these models are fully validated. There's a lot of room for, for improvement still. But the nice thing is that they're showing continual progress. And, uh, and I personally feel like they're contributing to our understanding and our ability to demonstrate what happens in fires at a macro scale. So just to back up a little bit and talk about how these fuels are represented. Uh, so if on, the, on the picture on the right here, you've got uh, sort of a view of the landscape with a grid superimposed on it, just to help you understand what's going on here. So in each one of those cells, for the specification of the vegetation, in each one of those cells, you would tell the, the computer code how much material is there and what some of its properties are. And so if you're in one of those cells that's between a tree or above a tree, those numbers just become zeros. So, um, so what we're trying to do with this is we're trying to get at the processes that fuels affect and the fuel structure effects, such as aerodynamic drag, heat transfer, moisture exchange and reaction rates, in order to do that right now, some of the things that are going into these models are local vegetation properties, including size and shape of the foliage. And this is really important because it affects the, the drag, the aerodynamic drag of the vegetation, but it, more importantly, it affects the heat transfer rates and how efficiently the grasses or needles or leaves are heated and cooled. Uh, the bulk density, which is basically how much uh, material is there, and the moisture contents. So um, these tools currently are being used for a variety of applications. Some are some should be considered purely research, looking at fundamental fire phenomenology, trying to understand the interaction between landscape disturbances such as bark beetle. Uh, mortality and fire. This is some work that Carolyn Sieg has been leading and Chad Hoffman's been heavily involved in. Uh, but there's some other applications that are 
more explorations and thinking about uh, influences of fuel management. Uh, there's uh, Dan Thompson and Jay Marshall and Dave Schroeder have been doing some, some nice work looking at different fuel management strategies in Alberta. And uh, James Furman, for instance, has been looking a lot at prescribed fire. And, and to dive into, well, I should, I should back up here and say, um, notice I don't have listed on this list operational fire prediction. These tools are really expensive computationally. Um, they take a lot of, they take a lot of uh, computational time and a lot of computational horsepower to, to run. And um, and different models take different amounts, but they're not they're not operational. Even with all that computational power, they're not running anywhere close to real time. So um, so just as, as an example, some of the prescribed fire explorations that um, oh that's nice. Um, some of the prescribed fire explorations that James Furman has been leading have to do with look, looking at different ignition strategies and looking at the effects of um, uh, different, different rates of ignition, different distances between ignition patterns and the, um, and the effects of, of that on vegetation consumption, as well as what it's doing for smoke production and lofting, and think about how how might we accelerate the training process, for instance, or how how might we learn about uh, the effects of, for instance, closing the flanks of of strip fires, or when you when is it better to use aerial ignition versus ATV to achieve your ecological outcomes that you want while getting the right smoke uh, production or lifting, I should say. So these are, these are some, some really important uh, explorations. And along the way, we always have um, interesting things that we pick up by looking at simulations like this. So on the left, you have a wind-driven wildfire. And in the small picture on the left. And in that wind-driven wildfire, people can imagine as the fire burns through a landscape, especially if it's a crown fire, it's removing material behind the fire. It's removing the aerodynamic drag. And what that, that has an important effect. That's nice. Um, that has an important effect because it, it allows wind to actually get in and, and feed the fire a little bit more. Prescribed fire and the three pictures on the, the three larger pictures on the right are now from prescri a prescribed fire simulation that as a part of James Furman's project, where there's a um, aerial ignition that's doing a Z pattern back and forth across the landscape lighting. But the important thing to think about here is that when you light with a prescribed fire, a lot of times you're working upwind. And the change there is that the aerodynamic drag of the fuel that you're removing, for instance, is downwind of where you're dragging the fire into. So that allows fire managers to inherently control the speed of the wind into the fire that they're putting on the landscape in a different way than is possible on a wildfire. So, um, so a, a piece of context or when we're looking at these, the output from some of these models is that physics-based wildfire modeling, it's, it's nice to support research, but we need to always keep in mind it's only a model. It's not reality. And, but I would pose the, uh, the mindset that these models pair well with observations. So fire experiments and field observations 
those are those are the real things. They're real fire. They're on the landscape. They're complete physics, right? There's nothing that's been excluded from from field experiments or observations, but they're only partially disclosed. That means that it's really hard to collect all of the things that are going on in those in those fires and collect all of the upstream wind conditions and all of the turbulence and all of the moisture dynamics, for instance, that's going on. So they're only partially disclosed. Whereas these process-based fire behavior models, they're only partial physics, right? There's as much physics as we can put in them with the resolution we have and the computational power we have, but, they're, but what we put in there is completely disclosed. So to the extent that we have the important processes, and you can always say we should add, add more, uh, but to the extent that we have the, the important processes in there, they're fully disclosed. So we can use them to interrogate the interaction between those processes and the balances that, that occur and the balances between those processes that then change fire behavior. It allows us to test our understanding because those models are in fact a manifestation of our understanding. Um, it can help us develop new ideas about how things are interacting and, and recognize important sensitivities that are occurring in different fire scenarios. And, oh, gee, I'm not sure, I didn't know that's why a fire did that. I've always seen it happen that way, but this is a really interesting new perspective. That kind of frame of mind is, is what I like to encourage about the use of these tools. Uh, but it's always important to keep to keep in the back of our mind the assumptions and approximations of the model formulations and not just treat them as black box and always true. So, um, so where are we now? We've, we've done use these, these models to look at um, a lot of behaviors. We've learned a lot about it and some things that we've back, we've, realized is it's really important to capture the interaction between fire and atmosphere. And it's also uh, really important to capture the 3D fuel structure in order to get at this, especially when we're thinking about prescribed fire, where things are uh, a lot of times sub, a lot of the critical behaviors are sub canopy and at smaller scales, that fuel structure really matters. So in an effort to take what we've learned from these high fidelity models and move it towards things that practitioners can use and, and especially things that we can uh, use to support prescribed fire operations, we've leveraged these two realizations that the two-way coupling between the fire and atmosphere is critical and the influences of the 3D fuel structure on both the fire behavior and the Wind. So what we've done is we've taken our fast running wind solver that was developed over a number of, over two decades uh, to support uh, some dispersion work and a uh, fast running fire model that's been developed based on things that we've learned from the high fidelity fire simulations to come up with something that we're calling quick fire. And the, the goal of quick fire is to be able to capture the influences of that couple fire atmosphere behavior and the fuel structure that then drive uh, fire behavior, including the interaction between fire lines and the response to changes in fuel structure, et cetera, that influence prescribed fires in such, a, such an important way. So where are we in the stage of development? Uh, We've been doing a lot of basic phenomenological testing, and I'll show you some of that. There's ongoing model development. We're doing refinements on things that are there. We're adding new capabilities. We're inviting new partners to, to bring their, their expertise and skills to the table whenever they want. Uh, we're trying to ramp up the comparisons between quick fire and, and higher fidelity models empirical observations and expert knowledge in more complex environments. We're beginning to explore the use of ensembles 
and sensitivity testing, uh, which Kevin will talk a little bit about. And we're really starting to ramp up the, the uh, desire to, to, to work with co-production partners. This, is, this tool will be much better if we have it developed in a co-production environment. Kevin will talk about that a little bit more. He'll also talk, hopefully, a little bit about the um, GUI interface that's on its way, which will definitely benefit from the co-production. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about the basic phenomenological testing we've been doing. Um, so the simulations, there's two simulations that are showing now. Um, one is at two meters per second, roughly four miles per hour, and the other one is six meters per second, roughly 12 miles per hour. And the red that's seen on the left is, is tall grass, and the purple is now combination of blue and red. Um, it's a checkerboard pattern where we've removed every other cell, and I think these are one meter resolution. Every other cell is open, has no fuel, and then the other cells have that initial part of the fuel, that initial load of the fuel, which is one kilogram per meter uh, squared. And so what you see is that low wind, and we're just doing initial phenomenological testing, making sure that the model is behaving the way we expect it to. And so at low wind, when we make this checkerboard pattern of the fuel, which looks purple, um, the fire can't get across to all the gaps. And so it, it blows in there, but then it runs out of steam and eventually it goes out. But at higher wind, the reduction of fuel actually allows the fire to accelerate and move faster because there's less competition between the buoyancy and the atmosphere and the wind can get in and affect the fire to a greater extent. Um, so testing the effects of fuel breaks of various sizes, and there's no rules in this tool that say, gee, for a one meter road or a one meter trail, you should jump it and two meters you still jump it. These are just the way the heat transfer is being represented and, and what it what it provides as output. So these are, again, just looking for basic testing. Um, and you can see that as you increase the width of the fuel break, the fire is more and more affected by it until eventually it goes out. Um, however, if I have a four meter road and I run a two meter per second, again, that's about four miles per hour uh, wind at it, stops it, but if I put a six at it, six meter per second or 12 miles per hour, um, it's able to jump and go on by. Um, it's important to, to, under, to make sure that our, our representation of the heat transfer and the effects of moisture are appropriate. And so this is left is 5% moisture, 20% moisture, and on the far right is 35% moisture, and 35% moisture is is just about out. It breaks in into fingers, and eventually those fingers can't propagate anymore. Um, we've been looking at the influence, at whether or not the model can handle, and whether it looks reasonable in the way it handles shifting winds. So here's an example where we just put a sinusoidal shift in the wind field over it to see what happens. And you can see that it, it uh, causes some interesting little pockets that in this tall grass fuel bed heal up. In other fuel beds, those don't ever heal up. So um, one, of the, one of the things we were after was make sure we got the coupling between the fire and atmosphere um, represented. And so one of the things that, that shows up in the field is if you close a ring fire, you drastically change the fire behavior. So here was an example where we were testing um, one of the ignition pattern possibilities in the tool, which was a dot ignition. And so you run a dot around a around a around a ring, and the behavior of the fire changes dramatically when that ring uh, gets close to being closed. And so it burns in; it, it collapses quickly, but then it uh, after it's collapsed, the indrafts die off, and then you're uh, then 
those the residual fire is able to pick back up and burn. Uh, more recently, we've been working really hard. Uh, David Robinson, more more specifically, has been working really hard on uh, on the implementation of a topographic scheme. We've been building uh, both both from the representation of the winds on over the big landscape as well as the fire behavior and the heat transfer and the effects of, of slope and, and topography. And so these are these are three views of that topographic simulation. I'll back it up one time and come at it. Um, so uh, in this case it's a uh, it moves relatively quickly because it's on topography, but it's not a super intense fire and therefore it breaks into fingers and it leaves a lot of trees on the landscape after it burns underneath them. So it's important for us to be able to think about when when does a fire consume trees and when does it when might it just force them and, and uh, when does it leave them in good shape. One of the the other things that we've been working on recently is capturing some of the effects of subgrade heterogeneity. And I don't want to say that that's all finished, but some preliminary testing is shown here. So in this case, we've got two meter grid cells and under, uh, we, underneath those two meter grid cells, we've got some homogeneous grass uh, in the upper left. And then we, we are imposing subgrid representations of gaps between the grass. So you have a patch of grass, for instance, that's a half a meter and then gaps between those patches that are uh, 0.1 meters and 0.25 and 0.5 and 1 meters. And so, um, you know, just qualitatively, we're getting what we consider a reasonable response to those uh, changes. One of the most um, important tests, though, was whether or not we get reasonable behavior when we simulate prescribed fires. So this is an Eglin Air Force Base landscape uh, that we pirated the fuel beds from James Furman's project and used those as to drive quick fire. Fire tech and quick fire actually use the same input decks. And so one of the uh, critical things that we were looking for in these simulations was a, did we get the same, similar results to fire tech? But B, if you look at the, the right simulation over here, the fact that we're getting different behaviors from the different lines, we're getting a more faster moving fire spread on the upwind fire than the downwind fire. And on these plots on the left, we've got some, uh, we've got holes that are being generated as, as you occasionally get some flare ups into the trees but yet we're not consuming the entire canopy. And I think I'm going to transition this to Kevin now because I think we're moving into his slides, but um, this is work that was uh, that was done by a master's student at Florida State University who just defended his master's thesis this morning. And I'm going to hand this over to Kevin. Thanks, Rod. Uh, assume that you can hear me okay. Yep. So Daniel Rosales is a master's student down here at FSU and works out of Tall Timbers. And, and as we take what Rod's done from a theoretical uh, background and the amazing modeling work that has been, been done to, to both simplify codes, make it real-time operational or near real-time operational speeds um, by, by just thinking logically through the physics that need to be included, um, you know, we, get to, we get to some very practical management applications and challenges, and that's where we'll, uh, we'll end the talk. You know, if Rod is the big brain of the group, I'm the big mouth of the group, but I'm going to try to finish before, uh, before 150, so 155 so that we can have some time for questions. But um, what you're looking at is, a, is a, a sensitivity test of sorts that Daniel's run based on the resolution of the fuels at a real burn unit at Eglin Air Force Base. It was sampled as part of the RX cadre experiments back in 2011, 2012. And these, uh, these fuels have been rep are representing at um, ranges of scales, horizontal scales, a two meter resolution in the top left, all the way down to just a very homogeneous uh, fuel bed like you might see in your, your typical Rothamel spread model equations down in the lower right. And, uh, and what we find is, is that not only does 
representation of fuels, which includes variability in um, in fuel moisture, fuel height, some of the bulk density, but the same mean across these different scales is that you get very different fire behavioral results. You get heterogeneity appearing when you resolve those, uh, those fuel elements on the, on the one hand, on the left, and then you get homogeneity and actually increases in forward spread when you do not have variability represented, even though the mean is retained across these simulations. Next slide. So, what we're stuck with as managers and, and, and practitioners is an increasingly complex landscape in which to apply prescribed fire. If you're in the southeast, you've, you've seen it. Uh, these are some of the prescribed fires we've done at Eglin Air Force Base and surrounding areas when I was there. Um, but what we need now, particularly as we try to expand prescribed fire into western landscapes or more complex landscapes in places like the, the northeast or Great Lakes, we need 21st century tools uh, to accomplish this, uh, you know, this the very important fuel reduction and, and, and ecosystem management tool we call prescribed fire uh, in this increasingly complex context. Next slide. And so what we have done at Tall Timbers and with Quick Fire in particular is developed um, an applications approach through the co-production of knowledge, which inherently involves managers and researchers working together as part of the uh, as part of a team that identifies not just research needs but evaluates research approaches and, into, and integrates and engages management throughout the process of tools and technology transfer. And Quickfire is an it is an outgrowth and a product of this co-production process. And uh, pardon me while I quote myself, but until now, now there's not really been any organized leadership for advancing prescribed fire science. And Quick Fire is one of the first tangible outputs of the prescribed fire science consortium, this coalition of, of managers and, and researchers that have come together to really identify and advance prescribed fire applications. Next. And the consortium really is dedicated to, to, to having a, a robust conversation about how science can influence and address management needs, but not just in the, hey, tell us your problem, we're going to go study and we're going to give you the solution, but really engaging people at all levels in trying to understand how tools can advance their jobs, increase the safe and effective application of prescribed fire, safe and, uh, and, and effective use of wildfire uh, when, it, when it's meeting resource benefits or suppression actions, training, et cetera. And so Quickfire was built with manager input and it's continuing to be validated by our management partners through a 3D, 3D demonstration forest network. One of the lead partners here in the Southeast is US Fish and Wildlife Service Southeast Region, uh, who are represented on the call today, uh, Region 8, um, USGS, uh, the New Jersey uh, uh, Chief Fire Warden, uh, Greg McLaughlin and Nick Skoronsky up there uh, at Northern Research Station and, and Florida Forest Service have all teamed up with us to try to think about how three-dimensional forests and vegetation representation can help advance our application of quick fire to meet management needs. And that dynamic partnership builds the idea of validation into the development of the tool process as we, as we apply it and, uh, and get manager feedback. Next slide. So one of the concepts that's really key here and Rod touched on earlier is that variation is a fundamental attribute of wildland fire. Most of our modeling tools try to smooth out the variation. We make assessments or assumptions of homogeneity, both in the wind field and in the fuel bed. And that just ain't very useful when you're actually standing on a plot of ground trying to conduct a prescribed fire with real stand level variability, fuels variation, maybe changing diurnal moisture conditions. And so being able to develop tools that that actually capture variation and understanding that the variation you capture is increasingly important as the fire behavior becomes more marginal when it's responding to those subtle changes of fine scale fuel moisture or fuel loading or changes in, uh, in directional or gustiness of wind fields. Those marginal conditions of, of flanking fire and backing fire require different levels of fuel inputs and insights and physical resolution in order to model accurately. And these are really critical tools that we use with prescribed fire as we conduct, you know, most of our prescribed fires, we start with a back and fire, maybe even a test fire. Um, and we look to, to, to see how we can adjust our firing pattern in subtle ways to meet ecological objectives. And so this concept of marginal fire really is driving the, uh, the level of resolution that the quick fire captures and is continuing to be developed on uh, uh, 
as it's, uh, as it's going through this co-production process. And one of the things that we're also really excited about is, is the fact that if you can create these physics-based coupled fire atmospheric behavior modeling tools, they can produ produce mechanistic fire effects. They're actually burning vegetation. We don't abstract the fuel, the vegetation as fuel. We treat vegetation as vegetation with real variability. And so now we can make you know, things, predictions of things like scorch, percent crown consumption, or uh, percent top kill. Next slide. So one of the things we're really excited about is the application of quick fire to operational planning in prescribed fire. Because planning windows, planning horizons for prescribed fire are often a little bit longer than, than initial attack on a wildfire, um, you know, we have the ability to, to utilize a little bit more complexity and thought in developing, uh, you know, in, in implementing and, and, and applying models to that prescribed fire process. But first and foremost, we know and we built into the quick fire model the capacity to ingest complex ignition patterns, whether it's strip head fire or uh, aerial ignition grid. You're not confined to just well, is it a dot pattern, a dash pattern, or a line? You can actually adjust the number of lines, the depth of, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the size of the gap in between dots or dashes, um, the rate of helicopter ignition or of uh, forward progression of, of crews on the ground. And so the capacity to really represent ignition patterns, the way that we actually control it as managers in the field, is so critical to, uh, to what we've done with quick fire. Um, because it couples that ignition um, pattern to heat release and couple fire atmospheric out outputs, and quick fire has a, an element called quick plume that now also is capable of distributing emissions uh, into the, the near field smoke column and being able to, to couple those, uh, those, those processes alofting that are related to the way you managers you know, actually conduct your prescribed fire is a game changer for being able to predict you know, downwind smoke, uh, smoke impacts. Lastly, um, you know, just uh, talk briefly about ensemble runs for prescribed fire planning. We're going to return to those in a later slide. But the ability to, to look at sensitivity of your prescribed fire, desired for prescribed fire behavior to things like wind fields, because quick fire is such a rapidly running model and it's got these couple fire atmospheric feedback uh, elements built in, we can now start to look at sensitivity of gusty wind fields, mean wind speed, gustiness, uh, you know, variability in, say, the, the, the uh, off-axis direction, if it's a south wind, is you know variable wind from southeast to, to to southwest. You know what is variation actually? What's what's its impact on your ignition pattern and your desired ecological outputs? Next slide. One of the things that we're really trying to capture now uh, as a way to apply quick fire through this 3D demonstration forest network is fuel as vegetation, or, and really kind of getting back to the idea that that what's burning is you know is is not just an abstract model of fuel, but it's actually vegetation with, with real variability that really matters to ecological outputs and, uh, and to prescribed fire safety. Next slide. And you know, one of the things that, that these ensembles are, allow us to do is test the sensitivity of things like the distribution of fuels in the unit. Here in this example, this could be a test fire result, which is burned area on the, on the left axis, could be heat flux, could be any metric that can come out of quick fire. But if we move our test fire from one side of a unit to the next, shifting left or right, and getting a different mosaic of fuels involved, we actually, under different wind speeds, get widely varying uh, results in this particular burn unit that was represented of fuels um, on a place called Pebble Hill where we've got some research plots, depending on whether you shift left or right. So understanding even how spatial variability within a unit is, is, a, is an inherent output that quick fire can provide to burn managers. In this case, um, you know, just shifting, uh, shifting into a more moist patch or a, a less moist patch of fuels within the exact same burn unit can, can literally double the, uh, the, the area of um, uh, uh, area burned. And, and because quick fire is a probabilistic model, it actually, when run as an ensemble, can give you the ability to, to have some statistical confidence in burn thresholds and the responsiveness of a fire behavior in a particular unit to the, uh, the wind field or range of winds that you might put in or the range of fuel moistures that you might input into the model. Next slide. You know, this, this idea of ensemble is going to really revolutionize the way that we think about developing prescription parameters, particularly for complex units. 
Again, I want to thank Eric Roll for and the 3D Fuels team for developing this slide. But you know, we've got the capacity now to sample forests, not just in two dimensions, but you know, with terrestrial laser, with airborne lidar, with cell phones now, uh, or even you know, a variety of other tools. We can we can represent vegetation and its three-dimensional components. And because quick fire is, a, is able to, to, again, couple quickly the wind, wind fields and the dynamics of a buoyant uh, heat source and the complexity of ignition, you know, we can start looking at how the three-dimensional landscape, both within the burn and as Rod was saying, upwind or downwind of the burn affects things like lofting of smoke or wedging of, of wind gusts and its effects on, uh, on fire behavior inside your burn unit. Next slide. And so the challenge that we have in operationalizing quick fire is, is really twofold. One is, is we need three-dimensional fuels. Uh, landscape level efforts to map fuels uh, tend to follow the Rothamel spread model. They, they abstract vegetation like land fire or south wrap, abstract vegetation into two dimensions um, typically. And, and we don't have the capacity at, at at present for many of these national level efforts for de developing or applying three-dimensional depictions of actual vegetations on a site. And one of the things that's super critical in scaling up the landscape is not just saying, hey, you know, this Eglin forest depicted here is longleaf pine uh, and it's got X loading and X moisture. It's actually understanding where fuels aren't. So much of fire behavior outcomes are driven not by what we light, but by what we leave unlit. And whether it's, it's unburned fuels on the outside uh, or um, or gaps that we leave in our ignition pattern or roads, it's really critical that we, when we scale up to the landscape scale, that we, that we actually represent the absence of fuel with fuel brakes and, and, and roads and power lines so that we capture the processes of eddying and, uh, and interactions with, um, with open canopy areas. Next slide. And so, um, one of the things that we've done uh, to, to further the process of co-production, which has been completely, uh, completely challenged by this, uh, this coronavirus crisis that we're in, is that we're going to try to do a quick fire led kickoff event working with the, uh, the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange and Nick Skronsky on the Northern Research Station and the, uh, the state of New Jersey. We'll be trying to do some real time co-production simulations and, and assessments of fuel variability in prescribed fire in New Jersey. And that's going to be upcoming September 15th through 17th. Uh, encourage anybody who's interested in, in participating as part of this, uh, this process of developing one of our uh, really critical demonstration forest networks there in the Pine Barrens to, to consider attending that workshop as well. Next slide. And so just to summarize, you know, quick fire is, is a very rapid simulation tool. Um, it's uh, in the process of being, uh, you know, faster and faster and optimized for, for, for more and more, uh, you know, RAM and more processing capacity, but right now it can run on an out-of-the-box laptop and it can run reasonably fast uh, in that faster than real time uh, on that environment. Captures, it, it really does capture critical fire atmospheric feedbacks that drive prescribed fire behavior. It's, I mean, every one of the prescribed fire managers on this call is its own supercomputer and you're, you're doing these kinds of calculations in your head, you know, every second anyway, but this is able to do this at a one hertz, one second rate. It's capable of capturing and predicting ignition pattern uh, impacts on updrafts and, and smoke transport. And it's capable of running in an ensemble mode that's going to revolutionize the way we think about developing prescription windows, particularly when they're on units that, that, we're not, that we don't burn every other year. Um, these, these harder and harder to burn areas that come with the complexity of, of you know, heterogeneity around the unit in an urban interface, for instance, uh, running those ensembles is going to be critical. Um, I'll just leave you with a few next steps and we'll open it up to questions, but we need to develop a user interface for the wider audience. And we're working right now with Spatial Informatics Group in uh, San, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, looking at, at trying to integrate these with, uh, with three-dimensional fuels for Florida and California's initial step. Uh, we are working with the Demonstration Forest Network to provide inputs to, those, uh, to this, uh, this, this emerging user interface so that we can extend uh, quick fire application to an average user, not somebody who's got to look at the uh, the numbers like the matrix screaming down your screen, but um, but testing the model in places like New Jersey, Arizona, um, you know, Florida, and uh, and Alabama. 
And finally, we're trying to develop default landscape level 3D vegetation inputs, working with a number of Department of Defense funded grants, including the 3D Fuels Project that's led by the Pacific Northwest Research Station and Eric Roll down here at Tall Timbers, uh, to think about landscape level inputs that we can have at our disposal in order to scale up from the demonstration forest network to the landscapes. And then lastly, and most importantly, we're going to continue to work with managers to refine the outputs of the model. You know, when you're thinking about prescribed fire modeling, at the end of the day, you know where it's going to be, I, you hope it, I hope anyway. Um, and so being able to, to talk about what, what would you like to see? Would you like to see percent canopy consumed, percent canopy estimated scorch? Would you like to see percent top kill of mid-story oaks? Those things that are resolved in the model, being able to, to work with managers so that, that any efforts that we have in developing the outputs are, are instantly relevant to you is something that we're committed to doing. And with that, Ron, I think we can click to the last slide and open it up to questions. All right, well, Kevin and Rod, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, enjoyed it, a lot of great information in there. Uh, my name is David Godwin, if y'all joined us earlier, uh, I'm the director of the Southern Fire Exchange and we just had Dr. Rod Lynn from Los Alamos National Lab and Kevin Hires from Tall Timbers Research Station uh, giving us a, a presentation on the quick fire uh, project that they've been leading. So we do have time remaining in our hour. If you would like to ask uh, questions of our speakers, uh, please use the Q&A uh, tool that you will see in Zoom to submit your questions and we will work to get to get through those. So we go ahead and pull up those. We've had some that have already started to come in. Uh, first, we, here's one that came up from uh, William. William asked if Quickfire is available for download and beta testing at this point. It, it is it is not um, just openly available at this point. It's um, but it can be it can be made available for for people that partner or whatever. It's just the model is changing so fast um, that uh, that we're still working through that distribution process and the way that's going to work. What we're trying to do with the demonstration forest network, as Rod says, is really kind of have uh, the initial versioning of the beta codes, particularly as a, you know, as a versioning comes out, where we have kind of super users at places like Tall Timbers or Los Alamos that, that um, or the Forest Service Southern Research Station that can help managers, especially in the demonstration for forest network, use uh, both the, the, the code as an executable standalone uh, or the GUI interface as we develop it um, as kind of an on-call service center model. And so over the next year, we're hoping to, to, to have all of that come together where, you know, if you're inside this network, we're, we're going to be working with you and, and you know, some of the, the folks that are, that are donating funding, their own funding to be a part of this, um, you know, are going to have access to, to Dura Unlimited modeling within the, the demonstration network. But it would be power user type provide, uh, similar to what we do with, with things like FS Pro runs on wildfires with F-bands and, uh, and Wooptus. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that came in from Eric. Eric asked uh, what programming language was used to create the model? Uh, the basic programming language underneath the, the hood is, is Fortran, but the GUI interface and, and the outputs and, and things are being done in other languages, including things like Python. So here's another question that, that came in about uh, inputs, and, and I think you touched on this, Kevin, at the end, uh, but you know, they asked you, interested in, in this specific spatial data inputs and formats that Quickfire would require for fire planning. Um, so I think they, they then get on to, could this data be imported from current products, or would it require uh, new field sampling? So looking to the future, do you do you think there are any existing uh, fuels products out there that would be enough to feed quick fire? Rod, you want me to tackle this and you back clean up? Um, there are some default. Uh, we got increasingly, you know, in many states, uh, airborne laser scanning, the LIDAR that's available for particularly capture and canopy distribution or the lack of canopy, um, you know, land use types. And then gap filling understory fuels is something that we're working on as well, sort of building out potential 
uh, representations of variation. Um, we're working right now too with uh, with the Southeast Region U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, John Wallace, to to beta test a monitoring program that builds these three dimensional landscapes at uh, Carolina Sand Hills and then uh, down at uh, um, at the Mountain Longleaf Refuge to think it, think about how we can quickly um, you know change the way that we do monitoring and fire effects to be able to, to not only provide, say, timber inventories, but also now three-dimensional uh, change analysis and future inputs into a tool like QuickFire. So some members of the demonstration network are really charging hard into this development of the 3D fuels, but at, at its core, it, it's actually a pretty simple voxel. Like the, these cubes of fuel that, that are at one to two meters, and Rod can correct me. I mean, you, you're, you're looking at, at things like fuel moisture, bulk density, and, uh, and, and surface volume ratio for, for some of the more complex fuel or complex models like FireTech. But QuickFire is one of the big advantages is that it's just a matter of sampling those things and then punching out that representative landscape and, and the tools to do it are, are really growing pretty rapidly. So here's a question that came in just basically asking about the computational power required to run this tool. Uh, is this something that you see folks using on mobile devices in the future? So there's all kinds of things on mobile devices that amaze me. An example of, of the computational power that's required right now, um, most of the simulations that that you saw were run on, on a Mac laptop. So, uh, you know, so out of the box, one approach that we're pursuing right now with the GUI interface is running it on a web server too, so that that it both facilitates quick and up quick updates of code changes as as we improve the model speed and things like that, but also so that that nobody's going to be limited. And I, I wouldn't say that we're you know real close to a mobile solution. We're going to try to get a desktop solution first, but it, but doing this on the cloud I think translates now into into more ease of access. Um, certainly, you know, just given mostly the prescribed fire planning is going to take place at a, you know, in a location where you have access to internet. That's, that's kind of our initial phase of rollout. So we had another question that came in about weather inputs, meteorological inputs. Uh, what are there existing, uh, products that, that tie into this model or, or, or is, is the future of quick fire dependent upon, uh, additional weather inputs that are available. So, so, um, so quick herb, which is the wind field, the wind solver that, that sits underneath quick fire has a number of, of built in ways to bring in uh, data. It can be specified as simple as, as a wind speed at a height, or it could bring in wind fields from wharf, uh, one of the things that we had some really good discussions on, and we got kind of sidetracked by COVID, but we had some really good discussions earlier this year with the Missoula Fire Lab about uh, connecting it to Win Ninja. And I, so I think, um, I think there's a lot of flexibility in how the tool can can accept winds, mm -hmm. uh, and part of that will be part of the part of that should be included in the GUI interface to dial in where the winds are going to come from is it user specified or is it coming off of some national service so i think um or out of it or as a bounding you know as a larger scale tool some, you know connecting to wind ninja or something else so to provide boundary conditions for instance so i think uh there's a lot of flexibility though the winds actually are some of the things that excite me the most about the quick fire interface is that it, it, it can use something as simple as sort of a, you know, a user inputted min, inputted mean wind speed. Um, and, and it'll create its own profile over a rough surface. Um, if you want lateral gustiness, you can use an actual sort of wind field to, to run the model. But Rod and the team are flexible enough to, to gather those wind inputs from other modeling sources at larger and larger scales to get sort of real time or predict, you know, near term predictions too. And so that flexibility of connecting, whether it's Wind Ninja or Wharf or just somebody's observation of, of actual wind from a, you know, a MET tower into a fire behavior modeling prediction system 
is, uh, you know, that kind of flexibility is, has already been created for other tools, but it's preserved into, into Quick. Um, one, one thing that I noticed in here, David, is this, you know, along those atmospheric um, coupling questions is considering atmospheric stability. And, and I think Rich McCray uh, specifically is interested in Haynes index mm -hmm. or at least some sort of way to incorporate atmospheric stability into model predictions. And I defer to Rod on that. <laughs> So, so atmospheric stability. There's there's some ongoing work to include atmospheric stability again in, in quicker, which which feeds on to uh, quick fire as well. Therefore, for plume interactions and and vertical motions in the atmosphere. So at this point, I, th I think we're over the top of the hour. There's a question that just came in that I think we'll we'll wrap up on. Um, you know, what do you see as the potential time frame for when this would be uh, launched into the field in a way that that your typical use, uh, users in the fire community and fire profession would be able to to see this on their computers and machines. Rod, I'd like to at least just say that, that, you know, the time frame depends on money and money depends on demand. And what we've done so far, Rod and, and Scott Goodrick and, and, and their teams have been amazing at piecing together this because we all believe in the process. But there's no dedicated large line of funding from any fire agency or organization. This demonstration up for us network are people like USGS, Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, throwing in a little bit at a time to develop it. And so the development time horizon is going to be dependent upon the demand from the end users. And so if you like what you see and you want to see more, you know, that, that demand matters. And being able to quantify that people would like to have access to these, these more complex fire behavior modeling tools and smoke modeling tools that are coupling fire atmospheric feedbacks, that will help. But, uh, you know, the timeline, I think, is dependent upon, you know, demand, and that will drive funding. All right. Well, uh, that uh, looks like we've come up just a little bit over the end of our time today. Uh, if you'd like to follow up with uh, Dr. Lynn or Kevin uh, and have a questions or uh, want to connect with them on this project, after what we saw today, uh, we have their email addresses on the screen. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you everyone. And thank you especially uh, Rod and Kevin. It was great to have you on today and we appreciate your presentation. Thanks, David. Thank you, David. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Mm -hmm.